Well, it's a beautiful day in about the second week of March. And classically, this is the time that we begin to get garden fever around here. We tell ourselves all winter that we're not gonna overdo it. And then a day like this comes along and the clover crop, the cover crop that we planted over the garden is looking healthy and nitrogen rich. And my bride has ordered a little sort of a disposable greenhouse. And I think now's the time to set that up. So we're gonna get the greenhouse set up and she will probably go simply wild. And we'll see what the upshot of that is this summer. But for now, we're not worried about the summer. We're just worried about garden fever and what we can do to get started on a new season. So the first thing we're gonna do here on the 22nd of March is plant some cold weather crops because there's still some cold weather coming. We're gonna plant some cabbage, some broccoli, some onions, and some sweet peas. So I'm gonna plow in this red clover that's been flourishing all winter. I'm excited to see what that does for the nitrogen content of the uh, garden. I'm gonna take one swipe across the end, plant a few little plants, mulch them, let them get a head start while we wait for real spring to get here so we can plant the rest of the garden, starting with the tomatoes. This is a bumper crop of crimson clover. Kelly planted 10 pounds of seed on this garden last October. It germinated, it grew all winter, it was beautiful. It transformed our garden from a weedy, messy, muddy mess to something that got better and better until three weeks ago it bloomed. Just look at that. And the bonus is it's putting nitrogen back into the soil. So what I'm about to do is continue what I started last night. The Kubota and I are going to sadly mow this to the ground. We're gonna let it lay there for, I don't know, next week the sun's supposed to come out. We'll let it lay there a few days until the soil gets dry enough to till. And then we will think about actually putting some tomatoes and some potatoes and some basil and all the other good things of summer in the ground. Only this year we don't get it in until as late as perhaps the first of June. So as you know, I'm not exactly a gardener, but it is, it's very compelling. You know, it, it feels good to bring food out of the ground or at least give the ground a little space so it brings forth fruit fruit, and you know all manner of good things but look at the difference I mean last night you the the drone footage that you are watching of the was of the tractor mowing this last night 24 hours ago and today's not been a terribly warm day but this stuff is already drying out and becoming brittle and breaking down and I think my rear tine tiller is not gonna have any trouble tilling this in you know, some folks said I should chop and drop and then plant through it. But this is part of our landscaping, part of our yard, part of the appearance of our place all summer. And it looks nice to till it and then, you know, try to control the weeds with mulch. And so we're having success with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and thrash this down, let it lay here a few days, and then we will till all of this organic material, nitrogen rich into the soil and watch the tomatoes just explode out of the ground. Uh, we planted raspberries last year, year before, little guys and now it is taking over the world and um, I think we're gonna have some serious raspberries this year I'm excited so the next step in this experiment of red clover as a cover crop is to see if I can plow it in we mowed it about I think five days ago so it's been laying there some of its bleaching in the Sun some of its trying to reestablish itself and keep growing but all of those stems are pretty tough and I'm very curious to see if this Time, if the tying action, if the rototiller action behind that little 23 horse tractor is just going to fill up with fishing line and come to a stop or if I'll be able to break them up and you know kind of push them into the grade and then they will continue breaking down and between the nitrogen on the roots as they tell me and the nitrogen in the green tops that they tell me is there maybe we will really make a difference in what happens in the garden this summer. It's time to put these in the ground. It was actually time two weeks ago but we were stalled because of weather. So these little 44 actually tomato plants 
are stressed. You can see the color's not great. They've got some leaves that are a little bit yellow. They've got plenty of water, but I think they're root bound. They're just not delighted with life right now. We're gonna lay out the strings and get the spacing right to accommodate the watering system that we have in our garden. And we're going to get them in the ground today. These tomatoes are in for a huge relief in just you know a matter of hours. And it's gonna be fun to watch what they do when they get a hold of their new situation. I think I frustrate my family because I take, what, now half an hour to lay out the tomato patch. And it's a half hour that makes no difference probably in the yield of the garden, but it makes a world of difference in how the garden looks when you drive up. And so for 30 or 40 minutes of uh, prep time on the front end, I'm happy to trade that for four or five months of additional satisfaction in the landscape aspect of the garden in our yard. But now is the time to actually pull the strings that'll give us the intersections on where the little plants will be planted into the dirt. So this is Rusty Leininger. I met him, oh, a month ago, a month and a half ago. He stopped in to talk about a really nifty project that he's spear tipping up on the Umpqua National Forest, and you're probably gonna get a chance to see and hear a lot more about that. But another interesting thing that Rusty does is he is developing a small business here locally, manufacturing, if that's the right word, and uh, educating people about the benefits of worm castings as a soil amendment. In fact, here is his uh, brochure that was tucked inside of one of the buckets of worm castings that he brought by. Rusty, what do we need to know about worm castings that I don't know and these people might be interested in? Well, it's worm castings are the best soil amendment known to man. Uh, most of us are hooked on synthetic fertilizers, which are all petroleum based, and we are what we eat. And I, we're kind of uh, approaching this as a devolution, I guess, or we're de-evolving uh. our gardening practices and how we uh, steward the soil. And what we're doing is taking compost and food waste and diverting that from our landfills and producing worm castings and diverting all that energy back into our soil uh, as a, uh, a healthier alternative to synthetics. He has brought these buckets by. There's five buckets of this uh, black gold, and the garden's too big to just broadcast it and till it in. So I've just about got my grid for the tomato plant set up. I'm gonna put a scoop or two at each tomato location, work it in, and why is it important to get it blow into the soil? Well, these are, the worm castings are full of microorganisms, which of course we need in the soil, and they don't like the sun. The UV light will kill them. <laughs> So it's good to get it mixed in or at least covered under a leafy crop, things like that. So okay. this is like a perfect time to get it implemented in. Great, great. Well, I'm excited, we're optimistic. Of course, gardeners are always optimistic at the beginning of the season, right? And then the real effort of keeping the weeds under control and keeping the water on it and rolling the dice to see what you get kicks in. But it's a worthwhile thing. Rusty, thanks for taking an interest in this and in our community and I'm looking forward to showing you what he's doing up the river in an area recently really um, I will say devastated by fire but they are and I'll tease this they are restoring um, shelters that were put onto the forest in the 1930s and are now in a severe state of disrepair using traditional methods traditional tools and local materials it's a worthwhile thing and I'm anxious to show you Rusty brought me enough worm castings to, you know, fully sort of benefit the first five rows of tomatoes. The last three are without, so it'll provide a good test so we can keep track of what the impact is. So anyhow, we're going to watch it and uh, see what, what uh, these tomato plants think of worm poop. Well, Scott went out of town, and before he left, he dug these really nice little furrows with a little implement that he borrowed from Cy Swan behind the tractor, made nice little ditches, and I'm planting potatoes in them while he's gone. And it's really working well, and it has saved a ton of labor. Thank you, Cy Swan. And here we go. I have learned one thing. It takes a lot of seed potatoes to plant potatoes. 
I'm sure I don't have enough now. I thought I bought plenty, but I think I might make two or three rows and then have to go back, but that's fine. Okay, here we go. So not everybody lives in a place like Oregon and not everybody lives on a little patch of ground where they can put in a garden. Not everybody has a little Kubota tractor to take some of the labor out of it. And yes, those are all advantages, but you can probably tell that the real advantage that I have is that not everybody has a wife like mine. I met Kelly when we were 15 years old on the school bus. And she gets tired of me telling this story, so I'm probably not going to tell it to the whole world, but I'll just say this. I've been married to her for 44 years and it has been way sweeter, way more productive, way more th worthwhile and frankly it has included way more joy than was possible for me to anticipate when we were pretty much just kids. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work. Mm -hmm.